下午第一位的讲者 Alexander Bruce。那他是澳洲，来自澳洲的开发者。那他在过去的七年中，他只有做一款游戏。那这款游戏在今年一月底上市的时候，他在 Steam PC 上面卖了二十几万套，呃，就是到目前为止总共累计已经卖了二十几万套。那一套的价格是十五块美金，不是零点九九。OK， 就是 make the point clear。那我们就请他来讲，就是他这七年的过程，跟他一些得奖，还有一些人生经历的一些这个。So please start right now. Thank you. So my name is Alexander Bruce, and I'm the creator of Antichamber, an independent puzzle game which was released earlier this year. Before this game released, it had received uh, 25 awards and honors in festivals and competitions around the world. It had received uh, financial investment from the Indie Fund, and it received major coverage across uh, many games websites around the world. When the game was released on the 31st of uh, January, it was number one on Steam within the first hour. The game sold 100,000 copies within the first seven weeks, and within six months, the game passed a quarter of a million sales. So, the question is, how did this happen? Was it uh, just a good idea? Or did I know the right people? Or was I just lucky? Now, these are some of the things that we would typically look at when trying to work out why someone was successful. And today I want to go through and break down what happened with my game because there's a big difference between uh, the public perception of what happened with the game when it was successful and what actually happened behind the scenes. And I want to talk about this because back in 2009, where I started, uh, I, was, I was no one. I was a student in university from Australia. No one had any reason to care about me. This was my first game, and I was creating it from a bedroom. But I did have one question, even back in 2009, before I was going to make a commercial version, which was, what makes me different to people who are successful? You know? Not as an entitled question, not as like, why aren't I successful? But what did successful people actually do, and is that something that I can do myself? But it would be a bit unfair to say that this was the start because even this question of like what makes me different to successful people had to come from somewhere. So I'm going to jump back a little bit earlier to when I started university back in 2005. And my mindset in university was very simple. If you pick any individual skill, I will not be the best at it. I am not the best artist because I have not been drawing since I was five years old. I'm not the best programmer because I'm not doing it in my day job. <clears throat> but what I'm good at is being different. I'm a very creative person, and I'm a very technical person, and I can do things that no one else is doing. And I would do this because this is how I was going to stand out in university and get high marks, and this would get me into industry, and then I would stand out in industry so that I could get promoted and get hired overseas because most of the companies that I would have wanted to work at were outside of Australia. So I, I started creating things like this. I made, in 2006, I made a, what I called dynamic geometry, where I could make a world full of tiles and then sweep complicated AI algorithms across them and get them to uh, do a whole lot of fancy things. And I turned this into a multiplayer combat game called Hazard, but at the time, I didn't know what to do with it, so I put it down. And the next thing that I made was this thing called recursive space, where no matter where you go in the world, you will wrap back around in the world. So for example, you can see I'm here, and then I can see myself rendered off in every direction as another wrap of the world. And at the time, I didn't know what to do with this game either, but in 2007, two and a half years through a four-year university degree, I got hired to work in industry at one of the biggest companies in Australia at the time to work with Unreal Engine 3. The prototypes that I'd made were with Unreal uh, Engine 2, and so I got hired to work with Unreal 3. And this was great because that meant that my plan of standing out by making these weird systems uh, was working. 
But working in industry made me a little bit jaded because my Unreal Engine 3 game that I was working on was cancelled after about two months, which took a lot of the skills that I had been uh, hired for and it threw them out the window. And I then moved on to an infrastructure team where everyone on the team was way more experienced than I was. And the whole time, even though I was just a junior and people didn't expect me to be at their level, I just felt inadequate the whole time. I kept thinking, I'm never going to be able to get up to the same skill level as, as these people, which was very frustrating. And I had to deal with a lot of crunch, like mandatory 60-hour work weeks. And the situation wasn't much better anywhere else in Australia. 2008 was when the Australian industry began folding in on itself. But something else happened back in 2008, and that was the explosion of independent development. And suddenly my plan of spending several years working up through the industry was no longer very appealing. So I was looking seriously at these guys, thinking some of these guys have completely skipped the system. Like these, these Nabacular drop guys created uh, a, a game while they were uh, at DigiPen. And then they got hired by Valve, and they made Portal. They went straight from being a student to being the top of the industry and they'd skip the whole system. And so I was thinking, what did they do, and can I do that as well? And this guy, Petri Piro, who made crayon physics, he was a student from Finland, which was also not an area known for making worldwide hits. And so I wanted to know what made him different to me. So I got this question of like, what makes me different? Can I do what these other developers did as well? Because somehow they've managed to skip ahead. And one of the things that I noticed about all of these games was a lot of them had gone through festivals. And so in 2008, because I was working with Unreal, there was this competition called Make Something Unreal, run by Epic Games. It had $1 million in prize money, split out over several phases over two years. And so I thought, I'm gonna enter this, and I'm gonna submit something very, very unusual and try to stand out like I do in university. And because I'm going to do that, I'm going to try and surprise people. I'm going to wait until the final phase at the end of 2009, and that's when I'm going to enter, because I have one shot at getting really good first impressions with this thing. And that game was this thing called Hazard, which I've been working on and off uh, since 2009, right, since 2006. And this game had a very unusual structure, just because I was trying to be different. And it was based around life and philosophy, because back in 2000 uh, nine art games were much more of a thing. And with the art style, when I was watching the games go through this in 2008 and 2009, they all kind of looked the same, because they would use the standard Unreal lights and shaders, and then they would try to differentiate themselves on art. And I didn't have the resources, the time, or the skill to compete on that level. So I decided that I'm going to compete by not competing at all. I'm going, if, if all un other Unreal games are at this end of the spectrum and they're all trying to go for realism, I'm going to go completely down the other end of the spectrum and submit something that looks absolutely nothing like any other Unreal game. And in 2009, this other thing happened called Sense of Wonder Night, which we heard about before. And this was interesting to me because The Unfinished Swan was a game that had gone through Sense of Wonder Night back in 2008. And so I was looking at Ian Dallas, the creator of that game, thinking, what makes him different to me? He's a student from USC, I'm a student. His game is about exploration and discovery, as is mine. And um, his game has a very unusual art style, and so does mine. So I thought I had a good chance. And fortunately for me, I got into this competition which represented a very big opportunity to me. I'd never been out of sight of Australia by myself, and I'd never been to one of these big uh, games conventions. And so I thought, I may never be here again. So if an opportunity comes up, I have two options. I either follow up on it, or I don't. If I don't follow up on the opportunity, I know exactly what will happen. Absolutely nothing will happen because I didn't, I, I didn't try to make anything happen. But if I do follow up on an opportunity, maybe something good could happen, maybe something bad could happen. That's the reason that I need to follow up on every single opportunity that I see, that, that, that unknown factor. And one of those opportunities was speaking with this guy, Mike Caps, the president of Epic Games. 
He was giving uh, a keynote at the Tokyo Game Show at the time, and I thought I have to say something to this person. So after his talk, I went up and I handed over a business card, and I said, my name is Alexander Bruce, and I created this game. I'm showing it at Sense of Wonder Night. I was just wondering, do you have a solution for independent developers? And I was expecting to just be brushed off because I'm no one. And he said, well, yes, actually. We have this thing called the Unreal Development Kit. It's not announced yet, but I will put you onto Mark Rain, and we will find the solution to your problem. So this guy is the president of a multi-billion dollar corporation, and I'm a random student from a country no one cares about, and he's reaching out to me. And this taught me that everyone is just another person, because at one stage in this guy's career, he was starting out trying to work out how to get up the ranks, and that's where I was when I was asking that question. And another opportunity was following up with, uh, was speaking with this guy, Steve Swink, who was another one of the presenters at Sense of Wonder Night. And at one stage he said, you should join the indie community. And I said something like, I, I, I can't, I can't make my own engine. And he said, you could totally make your own engine. You should go to uh, GDC, the Game Developers Conference, and you should meet these people. You'd fit right in. So here was someone who knew what they were talking about, who was encouraging me along. So after Sense of Wonder Night, I realized that festivals were a great way of getting noticed and meeting people because they drew a lot of people together from around the world. And I happened to get selected for Make Something Unreal, and I won an Australian competition. So I thought, I figured this out. I'm the same as the people from 2008. They went through festivals. I'm going through festivals. I will go through the Independent Games Festival as well. And I did get selected for the IGF, but I did get an honorable mention. And my first response to this was, why didn't my game get into the IGF? Like, surely my game was as good as the other games. It should have been picked. I don't understand what happened. What makes me different? Why am I any different to any of the other people that, you know, went through this? And then I started to get more critical and, you know, went to look back at my earlier successes to work out what actually happened. Sense of Wonder Night was a new competition. I entered in the second year. So 66 games were entered that year, and 11 of them were picked. That's a 1 in 6 chance of getting selected. It's not a guarantee, but those are very good odds. Make something unreal. Epic never expected a game like mine to be created on their engine. And so because of that, they awarded it a prize. They were like, we have no idea how you built this game, but it's really good. And the Australian competition was very small. No one cared about the Australian competition. Whereas the IGF was very used to showcasing the best of the best. And so I later learned that different is a starting point. It's not the end point. When you enter something like the IGF and your game is different, it's ultimately the same as everyone else's games because they're all trying to be different. And this is a better word, remarkable. It's not fun, it's not polished, not innovative, remarkable. Worth making a remark about. This could either mean conventional and exceptional, or it could mean unusual but very good, or it could mean completely insane and we don't understand it, but maybe there's something important here. So I picked myself up and in 2010 I had some more successes. I was one of the grand prize winners in Make Something Unreal, which gave me $25,000, and I could use the Unreal Development Kit to make a standalone version of my game. And I was also contacted by Valve to put my game on Steam, which was unusual to me because I didn't reach out to Valve. And so I was thinking, how did they find out about me? So I emailed Epic and I said, do you guys know anything about this? And they said, yes, we thought your game was great, so we said that Valve should take it. Which taught me the power of advocates. I didn't have the connections with Valve myself, but I did have connections with Epic, and so they could um, connect me through Valve with their connections. And so then I went to the Game Developers Conference following the advice of Steve Swink. And at GDC, I did what you would expect of someone going to their first conference. I ran around and I handed out a lot of business cards uh, to people because I, I thought, I'm not the first person to try and make and release a successful game. So I want to meet everyone that has done it before me. I want to learn about all of their mistakes and I don't want to make any of them. Um, I also... I also stopped by the Epic booth at GDC. I didn't want or need anything from them. 
I just wanted to say hello to them and be a familiar face because they'd helped me out and I wanted uh, them to remember who I was. I was also invited to speak at this thing called the Nuovo Sessions. And going into this, I had, you know, this was an opportunity again. I may never be in the, this position to speak at the Game Developers Conference again, but I want people to remember me. So I'm going to give them three things that they could possibly remember. They're either going to remember a very passionate speech about risk and experimentation, or they're going to remember a weird looking game, or they're going to remember that someone presented in a hot pink suit. And I didn't care, I didn't care which one of them they remembered. And this taught me that being different <coughs> is very polarizing. Some people loved what I did, and some people thought I was extremely weird. And this was dangerous because I want people to know who I am, but I also want people to take me seriously. I also had some interesting conversations at GDC. On the last day, there was a kind of secret party going on, and I was hanging out with some friends in the park who were going to this party that I was not invited to, and I said to one of them, can I come? And she looked at the invite and she's like, oh, I think, I think you can bring a friend. Other people had just said, you know, no, it's not my party. But she was like, I think you can bring a friend. Uh, and, and I said, oh, I probably shouldn't, you know. I'm no one. I don't really know the people. I'll just go back to my hotel. And her response was, I think you need to familiarize yourself with the phrase, fake it till you make it. It's a very cliched thing to say, but at that uh, moment, in my career, that was exactly the words that I needed to hear. You know, stop saying, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a designer, I'm not independent, I couldn't write my own engine. If you want to start being successful, start acting like you're someone successful. Stop doubting yourself. And at this party, I spoke with Mayor Shepard, who was another very successful developer, who was on the jury for the IGF in the category that I was nominated, uh, honorable mention for. And I was talking about how, you know, I was very disappointed that my game didn't get in. And she said, unfortunately, at the end of the day, only one game could win, but your game received a lot of support from the judges. I encourage you to not get discouraged and keep in mind the jury changes every year. So once again, someone who knows what they're talking about, giving me that little bit of encouragement I needed to say, you are so close, keep going for another year and then come back. So this taught me the value of real networking. The cards that I handed out to people at GDC didn't really do anything because walking up to someone and just handing over a business card, they're going to forget about that straight away. Most of the value came from random conversations I was having with people. And this is because you're building genuine relationships with people. You caring about them and them caring about you so that as you go along, you can both help each other out. So after GDC, I knew more than I did uh, before I went there in the first place. So I was going to take another three months of development. And in that time, I got invited to MDK at E3. And so once again, I wore the, wore the pink suit just to see what would happen. And a bunch of people came up and they said, oh, I saw you talk at GDC. Awesome. I want to check out your game. So I was very good. Both my suit and my demeanor and my game were very good at catching people's attention. And then they'd play for five minutes and put it down and move on. So they were, it, it caught their attention and then it couldn't hold their attention. And this was going to be a problem. I didn't want to just say, oh, this is just because I'm at E3 and there's a lot of other stuff around. Because if I was to release my game on Steam at this stage, then it would just get lost in a flood of thousands of other more interesting games than I had. So this was something I needed to fix. And E3 is a big press event. And I learned some marketing lessons there. You know, if you go to E3 and you expect to get lots of press coverage because all the press are there, explaining your game is extremely difficult. If you don't know how to talk about it, people won't be interested in it. And you have to explain it in ways that someone who has never played it before understands. So I didn't get a big explosion of interest from going to E3 that, you know, maybe I assumed would have happened. And so then I was thinking, what makes me different? Like, how did those people from 2008 get all of these, uh, all of this press and attention? And I was like, one of the problems is definitely going to be that it's just not maintaining people's interests. So I wanted to just fix the first 10 minutes of the game. You know, rather than have people play for five minutes, I just wanted to get them to play for 10 minutes. And watching people at E3 revealed a lot of issues, so I knew exactly what I needed to fix. 
And I then learned how important testing was, and I continued testing it on people from that point onwards, every week, every month, in, in very, very different ways. And this taught me a lesson about refinement. The more I refined the game, the more problems I found. Once I'd fixed 10 minutes, there were issues at 15 minutes. Once I fixed 15 minutes, there were issues in 20 minutes. This was, at the time, an eight hour game. So I was gonna have to go through and work out how to get everything up to the same level of quality. I entered some other competitions in 2010, and unfortunately, I got rejected from several of them. And like even with an Australian competition, I got nominated several times and then didn't win. And this was taking, this was starting to take a toll on, on my emotional state because you're constantly like building up hopes and then having them crushed, and you're building up hopes and having them crushed. And the whole time you're like, my game is better. Surely I can get into these things, but you you just keep missing out. So I was getting very sick because I felt like I wasn't getting enough, enough done, so I was working longer hours. Working longer hours meant I was sleeping less, sleeping less meant I was becoming sick, and being sick meant I was getting less done. So again, I've got this question. What makes me different? How the hell did other people get through this? Is this just hard, or am I struggling because I'm just not good enough? And so I decided, even though I didn't get into Indicade, uh, I was going to go to the festival anyway, because I needed to talk with these successful people again, and also, under the fake it till you make it mindset, I wanted to be the guy that was known for just being everywhere. So that if someone had been at GDC and someone had been at E3, they'd then see me at Indicade and be like, who is this person that I keep seeing around? I want to know because he seems like someone. I got into another competition at GDC Online. This one had a $100,000 prize and I didn't win once again, so I was burned by expectations again. And this was a very difficult lesson to learn. But I was seeing signs of progress at this. You know, now, now people were playing on average for 20 minutes and they were enjoying it a bunch more and I was starting to get some more press. And I met my sound designer there and I was getting interest from publishers. And so I was struggling to make the game and I thought maybe these guys could help me out or you know, maybe they could help with console versions of the game, which were a big thing back in 2010. And at Indicade, I spoke with Ron Carmel, who made World of Goo, and he said, don't go with a publisher. If you can get this game greenlit on a console, I will fund you myself. So he gave me all of these reasons for why a publisher wouldn't work for my game. But he offered me money, and this was something that I didn't have before. So now I started chasing up uh, Sony and Microsoft very seriously, trying to make a console version happen. And I also spoke with Daniel ben from Today I Die about how I was struggling and how I was getting sick. And he said, you're doing really well, but you need to slow down. Um, or you will just keep making yourself sick. You know, this is, this is a marathon and I had been trying to sprint and if I wanted to get through this very long process, I really needed to relax back a little bit because I was doing fine. I then got, uh, in, at the end of 2010, things started turning around. I got nominated in IGF China. I got nominated in the IGF. So I had turned my honorable mention into a nomination. And I got nominated in the Indie Game Challenge. And the Indie Game Challenge was at DICE in Las Vegas. And this was an executive conference. So all of the heads of studios and important people from Sony and Microsoft were there. So because I had this uh, opportunity for funding from Ron Carmel, I then spoke with Epic, who I had been keeping in touch with and who had helped me out before, about uh, console versions and how I would need an engine license. And they said, well, we can give you an engine license for free you know, normally it costs a lot of money, just because they knew who I was and they had seen that I was starting to get some successes. And so having an engine license meant that I had solved two of the three things that I would have needed if I wanted a console version. So then I just needed to chase up with Sony and Microsoft and both of them were very interested in the game. And I also got some more very good coverage from DICE because the game was coming along really well. And these were, these were all important people from uh, big, big websites. But I was getting some different kinds of questions now. I was getting questions like, how are you going to appeal to the Call of Duty crowd? And my daughter loves Minecraft, why would she play this? Now I was not aiming at these audiences at all, but the fact that these questions were being asked meant that people were starting to take this game more seriously. It wasn't just a small, independent, artistic game anymore. Now it was something serious. And Dino Patty from Limbo, 
was hearing some of these conversations and he said, ignore everything that those people said. We were getting asked a lot of the same questions before Limbo was released. You're doing fine, just keep doing what you're doing. So again, someone who has seen a very, very big success telling me I'm on the right track, just keep going. But I also had this uh, conversation with Jamie Cheng from Clay, who was one of the judges in the Indie Game Challenge. And he said, why is it called Hazard? And I tried to justify it to him, and he said, hmm, that's, that's interesting because the title didn't match the experience that I had playing the game. So previously, people had said, you know, I hate the name, or, or I don't, it, it doesn't make sense. And, and he was giving me some more feedback, some more useful feedback than that. But at the time, I didn't really think too much of it because I had bigger, bigger things to worry about because I was in the IGF. And this is, you know, the most prestigious competition in the world, and, and this was when everyone was suddenly going to care about me, and I was going to get this big explosion in uh, the press, and I thought, I have a really good shot at winning this competition. And that taught me some more hard lessons. Expectations hurt. Even though, like, like the expectation that maybe I've got a really good shot at winning meant that my hopes were crushed when I didn't, and this was the last time I was ever going to build build expectations about something. And I also didn't get this automatic explosion of interest. You know, I, I, it, it was a fairly weak show as far as press was concerned. So I was thinking, what makes me different? How did the people from 2008 uh, get all of their attention? Why did people care so much about them? And then I realized that this thing called survivorship bias existed. By just looking at successful people, and what they had done, I was missing out on all of the unsuccessful people and what they had or had not done. So for example, many IGF nominees every year get forgotten because they will also do things like I did. Go to GDC and not make a big song and dance about it to the press. And then they won't have a lot of press show up at their booth because they just assume that you get into the IGF and then everyone cares about you. And unfortunately, that's not how it happens because the IGF is not an endpoint, it's just another thing that happens along the way to releasing your game. So after GDC 2011, my circumstances had changed again. My game was coming along really well. People were now playing, on average, for between 40 and 90 minutes at the IGF Pavilion, where you have some exceptional games there and people wanted to play my game for up to an hour and a half before I finally kicked them up. And this was a dramatic difference from the original five minutes back at E3 half a year earlier. And I was now trying to negotiate console versions with uh, Sony and Microsoft, and so I was gonna take just another six months until I released the game. And then I started getting some very critical feedback from developers that I respect greatly. And they were like, you need to change the name. And they were giving me actual good feedback. For example, Jonathan Blow said, this is a game that I think a lot of people will want to play, and your name is going to be the first thing that people see, and it's going to attract or turn off the wrong audiences. It's going to attract the wrong audience, and it's going to turn off your audience, because Hazard makes it sound like it's in the same category as things like Killzone and Bulletstorm. It'll sound like just another FPS, and it'll get lost, and that worked as an Unreal Tournament 3 mod where I wanted to mess with expectations, but that doesn't work when I'm trying to make and release a successful commercial game. And I said to these people, well this is quite risky because I've now built up a year's worth of press or more under the old title. I don't want to just throw that away. And Jonathan said, I know it seems like you've got a lot of uh, attention, but the number of people that know about and care about your game right now is insignificant compared to the number of people that will know about it under the correct name. And these were very good points. If I was putting so much attention and care into the design of the game, the name to me was just another part of the design of the game and I needed to make sure that I got those first impressions perfect. So I decided to take the risk. And it took three solid weeks of doing nothing but talking about the name with people to try and find exactly the right word or the, or the right name. Because I couldn't just change it to something different if that name was not actually better. I needed something remarkable, worth talking about, that set the right impressions. 
And that's where antechamber came from. And people could hear this and they could immediately think the correct things. You know, inverse chamber, against chamber, or an entrance to a larger space. And if I was going to get this, um, if I was going to get this name to stick with people, I needed something big to happen. And fortunately for me, this year I got into the PAX 10 back in 2011. And this was the second most important competition to me after the Independent Game Festival. And so I announced the game immediately after I was notified. And only one website posted about the change. So this told me that I would have to do a hell of a lot more work if I wanted people to know about the name. So I started going a little bit crazy. So I submitted footage to Indie Game the Movie. I then got nominated in Indiecade. I won some awards at Australian festivals. And I started sending the game off to people all around the world. Anytime anyone contacted me to have the game in a school, in a university, in an art gallery, in a festival, in a competition, I was like, absolutely, you can just take the game and, and show it off. That, that works for me. And now, because I was spending so long on this and trying so hard, I had people saying, why are, you, why are you trying so hard? Like, why aren't you working on your second game? And I said, I'm trying to get something up to the same quality of games like Braid and World of Goo. And they said, well, that's a big call for an indie. And at this stage, I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Like, now I've spent a year and a half or, you know, two years you know, testing all of these assumptions, going through festivals, getting awards, building connections, getting press, refining my idea, doing all of the same things that these other people did. And at this stage, I realized that the, the, the answer to what makes me different was actually nothing. Nothing makes me different to these successful people. But I only knew that that was the answer because I had gone through and done all of the same work that those guys had done. Now I had a new question, which was, how do I not mess this up? Half of success is finding out what it takes to be successful and doing the right things. The other half is making sure that you don't make bad decisions and mess up your chances. So one of those, one of those mistakes could have been if I released the game under the wrong name and I just turned people off before they even looked further into it. Another one of those mistakes would have been if I continued negotiating consoles because I was a single person doing all of this stuff and consoles took a hell of a lot of time and energy. Not just time sitting at the computer programming, but all of my you know, subconscious time when I was sleeping or when I was in the shower. If I was working, at, if I was working on business rather than design, that was ultimately going to end up in a worse game. And a worse game on more platforms is not beneficial to anyone. And so even though I was offered a large sum of money from Sony, I turned it down because it would have required way too much upfront risk. So I then went off to the PAX 10. And I had learned a lot from the IGF back in 2011. And so this time, I really wanted to make sure that I got a lot of press to come by. And I went in there with no expectations. I just wanted to have a good show, you know, hopefully people would show up at my booth. And I thought Fez would get all of the attention. But what actually happened was Kotaku said th that my game was their favorite game of PAX. Giant Bomb covered the PAX 10 and the comments on that, on that website started going crazy. A number of other websites were saying this was the best thing that they had seen at PAX and Notch or um, the creator of Minecraft played the game and he really loved it as well. And he was, a, he was another key influencer for independent games as well. So having him on my side would be really good as well. So how did I respond to this amazing response that I'd been trying to make happen for a year and a half at this stage? With depression. Because now I realize that having all of these people caring about your game suddenly means that you need to live up to all of that hype. And my game was still several months away from being released, and now I'm thinking, everyone cares about it right now, and this game is not going to come out for another six months. Maybe this is a mistake as well. And I was also running out of money by this stage. So I gave myself until IGF 2012 to say, 
I'm going to get this finished and released, and whether or not I get nominated or not, this is my deadline. And fortunately for me, I did get nominated in the ITF again, and that was very rare. Only six games had done that, had been nominated twice in the history of the IGF, so that was another big opportunity. So I'd learned a lot of lessons from IGF 2012, and once again, I wanted to just make sure that I had a good show uh, for the, the IGF 2012. Another mistake that I made was I didn't release new video footage when I announced the um, name change. And so I wanted new footage for after the IGF, so that if any press wrote about it, they'd have a good video to link. And this time, much like the name, the video could be the first thing that people actually see. And I needed to make sure that this was going to set the correct first impressions. So this time, I got help from experts in the field. So for example, this Antoine guy, he cuts together the trailers for Assassin's Creed. And Kurt does a lot of trailers for independent people. And when I released this, because I now knew a lot of people in the press from a year and a half of going to conventions and getting people to write about me, I sent it out to all of them and they were all on my side. So they all posted about it and I saturated the news on that day of release. Because so many other people were writing about it, more people wrote about it and Notch and a lot of other very respectable people were also tweeting about it a lot. So this was very good, this was a very good test of the reception of my game whenever I should launch it. And at the IGF, this time I had no expectations of winning. Once again I thought Fez would win and I just wanted to have a good show. I was just happy to be there again. And fortunately for me, I happened to win the technical excellence category. And at IGF, I solved my financial problem by signing with the Indie Fund. And this time I had a crowd of people constantly around my game. There was no average playtime because I just had to keep on kicking everyone off so that I could keep moving other people through. And I wasn't seeing many issues in the game at this stage. And I also got a hell of a lot of good press. Not just because my game was better than the previous year, but also because I won but especially because I reached out to all of these people myself to make sure that they showed up at the booth. So once again, this show could not have really gone better for me, so how did I respond? I made statements like this. My game still isn't done. I feel worse than I've ever felt. I don't have anything to work towards now, and they took away my goal. This does not sound like someone who just received an award they had been chasing for three years this sounds like someone who is having a mental breakdown. Because I was doing all of this for years in a bedroom by myself. And having you know, constantly increasing expectations was, was taking a huge toll on my mental health. And unfortunately, I couldn't quit. I had spent about a year hating life, thinking I want to give up, but I couldn't because that would have been a waste of all of the time that I'd put into it so far. And I couldn't release an unfinished game because that definitely would not have lived up to all of the hype and expectations. So I just had to keep going. And fortunately for me, I was not alone. Other people were also going through this process. And this helped me understand that this is just what it took for our personality types to get through. And this is what it took to pull off something this massive. So I just needed to get the game done. So 2012 was mostly the same. I'd spent a couple of years working out what it took. I now knew exactly what I had to do. I just had to get the game finished. And I was desperately trying to get it done. 2012 was the year. I was absolutely not going to let this uh, bleed over into 2013. And I was feeling very jealous throughout 2012 of every successful game that released because I was thinking, why isn't that me? And the answer is because my game isn't done and I haven't worked out how to do that yet. And I was getting very paranoid about failure. Now I had put so much on the line, so much of my time, and I needed to make sure that I didn't fail because some of my other friends that had been through all of these festivals, they got awards and they got press, but then their games came out and they had very soft launches. And I had to work out what mistakes they had made and then make sure that I didn't do that uh, as well. And then I went to PAX East and PAX Prime as well. PAX Prime was my last show. And YouTube streamers were becoming a much bigger thing throughout all of this time. 
And one of the very popular ones was called Total Biscuit. And I knew that he was a good streamer because there were many reports of people releasing their games and getting covered by Total Biscuit and having huge spikes in sales. So if I wanted uh, good sales, I wanted to make sure that I also was covered by this guy. And one day, shortly before PAX, he sent out a tweet that was like, any developers that are going to be at PAX, um, contact this PR company, we still have some room in our schedule. So that presented a huge opportunity to me, and I left on that immediately, and I made what I thought was the best possible piece of promotion for the game. Total Biscuit was playing uh, the game the first 15 or so minutes, so people could see it being played genuinely, and every time he had questions or pointed out something, I was also there to talk about some of the reasons behind these things and talk about the deep um, psychology going on behind some of the decisions. And I asked him, when are you going to release this video? And he said, we're going to release this as part of a PAX roundup, so in the days after PAX. And I said, mm, that's, that's, that could be a bit of a problem because I don't know exactly when my game is going to release. I hope it will be released next month. But this is a game that can be spoiled very easily, and I want to make sure I don't get a lot of attention and then just lose it because the internet moves very fast. And Total Biscuit said, don't worry, like we will talk about the games again once, the, once it's released. And I was like, all right. I then spoke to all of my other developer friends at PAX, and I said, I've just got this great video with Total Biscuit. And they were like, oh, awesome. The day that his video was posted was our biggest day of sales. And this, to me, would have presented a problem because I didn't want to throw away my biggest day of sales when the game wasn't available to buy. <coughs> so I sent Total Biscuit an email, a very long email, laying out everything that I'd spoken about, saying, please, can you hold this off until day one? If what other people say is true, I want day one to be my biggest day of sales. And this game is extremely difficult to promote. And so he was like, all right, we'll hold it off. We wouldn't normally do this, but we understand your situation. By this stage, I had missed out on October. And so if I wanted to get the game released in 2012, I would have to release it in November. Releasing in December is a black hole because the Steam sales are always on and you don't want to be anywhere near those sales. So November was, was my last chance. So I said to Valve, can you tell me what dates are good to release the game in November? And they said the 14th and the 28th of November look pretty good. So I spoke with the Indie Fund about this. And the Indie Fund said, hmm, this is, you have to be careful because Halo releases near the 14th and around the 28th, you've got Call of Duty and you've got Assassin's Creed and you've got all of these AAA titles that you don't want to get lost in. And at this stage, like, I'm very desperate to get this out and I had to say, guys, just tell me what to do. So Nathan Vella said, wait until January or early February. You will make more revenue releasing at a good time than you will lose via the delay. Ron Carmel said, delaying will also give you time to plan and execute a launch PR plan. Aaron Isaacson said, you've spent so many years on this, I think you want to give people some time to get ready for its final release. And Kelly Santiago said, Journey was on a similar schedule, and I think we really benefited from the added time to do a proper PR leader. If for no other reason, this advice was the reason that I wanted to sign with the Indie Fund, because this was invaluable. Releasing at a bad time would have been the biggest mistake I could have possibly made, and would have thrown away potentially years of my life. So I spent most of January building up a release plan. I was talking with friends in the press to work out when the reviews calendar was totally dead so I could make sure that I released when no other games were around. I was talking with all of my other developer friends about pricing and about the, the date and um, sanity checking all of my trailers and my assets and passing them all by professionals. I wanted to leave nothing to chance. I did not want to release this game and then ask why wasn't I successful. I wanted to know the answers to all of that before I released and made sure that I did all of the right things. 
And the end result of that was this. On the 30th of January, I released my trailer one day early to try to start uh, building the hype up again, right before people could buy it. And because my trailer went up, and because my Steam page went up, Giant Bomb released their quick look video one day early. And because they did that, Total Biscuit released his video one day early again. This was a mistake, but it worked out better in hindsight because 14 hours before the game was available to buy, these videos went up. No one had played the game yet. No one could step in and say, ah, oh, I played it, it was okay, I guess. All I had from this was non-stop hype for 14 hours. So that, on the day I released the game, I was number one on Steam within the first hour. My first hour was over 4,000 sales, and I'm certain a lot of them are because of the Total Biscuit video, people who just opened up the Steam page and then just let the timer count down so that they could buy it instantly. I had over 40 reviews, there were over eights and nines. There were some negative ones, but you know, that happens. I got a whole lot of high profile YouTube coverage because of Total Biscuits video and because Notch from Minecraft kept talking about it. So all of the people who stream Minecraft regularly were also posting videos. And I got non-stop Twitter discussion for the next two weeks. So the takeaways from this talk. Number one, this was all very messy. None of this happened quickly. That last day where I had all of this big success was in development for nine years. Nine years of making decisions, seven years of working on the game, three years of obsessing about it and trying to understand the science behind success, all for one day. Then you've got this one about luck versus opportunity. People look, typically look at successes and they say, oh, they were lucky. And I always had a very hard time accepting that there was this magical factor called luck that struck some people and didn't struck other people. So the Total Biscuit video, for example, some people said, you're lucky that you got covered by Total Biscuit. And I would say, what are you talking about? That was months of work making sure that I had a good video and that it was released at the correct time. But those people aren't entirely wrong. The lucky factor wasn't that I ended up with this video at the end. The lucky factor was that shortly before PAX, Total Biscuit sent out a tweet saying we still have some room in our schedule. Because I could have been watching everything he said 24-7 throughout the day, and if that tweet doesn't go out, the rest of that branch of the story doesn't happen. But just responding to that tweet doesn't guarantee the good video either. The only reason that I had a good video with him was because I had spent three years knowing how to talk about my game so that when it finally released, it was a good enough video for people to get really excited about it. Total Biscuit later tweeted that most of the developer videos that he does with people actually get received really poorly because people don't actually know about their game. And then he said, except for the antechamber video and one other video. So that's why that to me is not luck that this good video was there. The luck was just the tweet that goes out. And the reason that's important is because that's an opportunity. Something that seems very insignificant, but these kinds of things are happening every single day and you need to be in the right mindset to know that these are an opportunity that you should leap at. Another takeaway is that specifically what I did in this talk is not what's important. Why I made the decisions is what's important. I could have followed World of Goo's strategy exactly and I would not have been anywhere near as successful as World of Goo because my game was totally different to theirs. I had very different experiences to them. But by understanding why they had made those certain decisions, and by talking with them to understand the reality of their development, I was able to work out what were the correct decisions for me to make. And this requires brutal self-awareness and constantly questioning assumptions and course correcting. The reason I had such a hard time was because I had to take everything so seriously and test all of my assumptions before I got around to releasing the game and then just said, why wasn't I successful? I should have known the answers to that question before I even released and then done something about it when I still had time. Another takeaway is that none of this happened in isolation. 
I was working from a bedroom for several years, but that wasn't the only thing that I was doing. I was constantly getting out of the country and meeting everyone who had done this before. And even though I did 80 to 90% of all of the work myself, and then got some contractors to help out with the rest, hundreds or thousands of other people were necessary throughout the development to sanity check everything that I was doing and to provide critical feedback along the way. And the final takeaway is that making games is hard. This was the hardest thing that I've ever done. And the reason I wanted to give this talk is because a lot of people will look at independent development. And like me, at one stage, they will just be looking at the successful people, thinking, doesn't that sound amazing? You know, all of that success would solve all of my problems. Actually getting to this stage put me through the lowest points in my life in order to get there. And so I just don't want people to look at independent development through rose-colored glasses and assume that this is easy because it's not for anyone. This is extremely difficult. Thank you.